The Milky Way is one of the biggest mysteries out there, literally. It's hard to figure out how big our home galaxy is. And one of the main reasons is because we live in it. Think of it as walking around a mall. You can tell it's big, but you can't be certain until you actually see it from a bird's eye view. The Milky Way consists of billions of distant stars that look like a string of lights from afar. So you just need to measure the distance between these stars and voila, you have the answer. Eh, not really. I might have forgotten to mention opaque clouds of dust blocking your view. Some scientists were stubborn enough to run computer models of how galaxies form and evolve. There's a halo around our galaxy, so the scientists wanted to see if there was some sort of a dead end in the Milky Way. They found out that the Milky Way spreads for 100,000 light-years away from its center. It likely means that the entire galaxy is around 200,000 light-years across. The problem with this estimation is that halos don't tend to have some final border since they simply fade away. It's like pointing a flashlight and trying to see precisely where the light ends. In 2013, the Hubble Space Telescope captured an image of something 25 million light-years away. It turned out to be a spiral galaxy, later called ESO 3738, with at least seven other galactic neighbors. And this galaxy is as thin as a pancake. A very shiny pancake. The telescope also took a photo of another galaxy cluster 65 million light-years away. It was called IC 335. It's another glorious glittering pancake floating in the vastness of space. The images the telescope took aren't the most accurate. It's hard to tell what exactly you're looking at. These disk galaxies have lots of dust clouds that can stretch for hundreds of light years across. They're mainly located near the centers of galaxies and are invisible in regular light. But they can be detected with the help of a blue filter. Anyway, this IC335 galaxy is an oval disk with huge clouds of gas and dust. This means stars constantly appear there. But not all galaxies create stars. A galaxy is born as a giant ball of slowly rotating gas that is steadily collapsing in on itself. As it starts spinning faster and faster, the pancake shape is formed. Ooh, pass me the syrup. It's like spinning pizza dough in the air after rolling it into a ball. The topping is stars, and the sauce is clouds of dust and gas. Are you getting hungry like me? Some galaxies can lose their gas and dust if they become part of a galaxy cluster. Then all these mini-galaxies orbit their common center of mass, with gas separating them. When a disk galaxy dashes through them like a speeding train, the pressure can blow away this dust and gas. From far away, it looks like you're staring at a DVD you're about to play. But if you traveled millions of light years to get a closer look, you'd see a dim disk filled with stars. You wouldn't even be able to tell you're inside it. You'd also see a bright blob of dust left by the red giants in the middle of the galaxy. Red giants are massive and very bright stars with low surface temperatures. But the images of these galaxies don't actually show us their real color. Cameras make up some of these hues so that you don't have to look at something fuzzy or grainy. People don't actually know the real colors of distant galaxies. Our galaxy has a lot of gas inside, like me. So we don't need to expect our home to dry up anytime soon. In fact, the Milky Way still produces new stars around 7 a year. But some galaxies fade out when they can no longer create stars. In the industry, they call it strangulation. And it happens when galaxies run out of gas. Which means there's no more new material that can be used for star making. Gas and dust aren't the only things you can find in a galaxy. Just like a magician pulling a rabbit, flowers, or other things out of their magic hat, galaxies have other surprises. Like planets, those balls of matter spinning around themselves and around other things. Well, technically, planets are far from being perfectly round in shape. But they aren't also flat like spiral galaxies. It's mostly because of gravity. Its force is so strong that a planet pulls everything towards its center, taking the shape of a sphere. In the process, all the edges and anything else that might stick out get smoothed out. But the smaller a space body is, the less round it is. Take a comet. It doesn't always have a smooth surface. It's small, and therefore, its edges are rugged and pointy. Given the size of Earth, it's safe to say the gravity is strong here compared to that of the Moon or any smaller size space object. And because of our planet's constant rotation, there's an outward bulge on Earth. This tug of war between the gravity pulling inward and the planet's spin doesn't allow Earth to be a perfect ball. 
On top of Earth not being a perfect sphere, the planet is also tilted. This design flaw is responsible for the seasons we have. This tilt could happen because millions of years after Earth was formed, it probably collided with a protoplanet, a large space body developing into a planet. Venus is unique because it rotates backward compared to the rest of its peers. If you were standing on Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, you'd see the sun rise in the west and set in the east. But you'd have to make it on time to observe this phenomenon. A day on Venus lasts for more than 240 Earth days. For a long time, scientists believed that the sun's strong pull on Venus was responsible for such a long day. But new theory claims that Venus used to spin just like Earth and the rest of the planets. But at one point, it just flipped its axis 180 degrees. It doesn't mean the planet abruptly stopped halfway through the rotation and started to move backward. When theory suggests that a large comet or object struck the planet in the past. This might have caused it to change the direction of its rotation. But many scientists doubt this theory. If you observe the moon for some time, you may notice that it's the same face staring at you every night. The truth is that the moon does rotate, but very slowly. It takes our planet's natural satellite 27 Earth days to rotate around its axis. Plus, the moon rotates at the same rate that it orbits Earth. The side we always see is called the near side of the moon. And the side that's not facing us is, you guessed it, the far side of the moon. It also has the nickname the dark side of the moon. Uranus's rotation axis is 98 degrees relative to the plane of the solar system, which basically means that the planet spins on its side. For a while, scientists believed that a large object firing through space knocked into Uranus, causing it to tilt. But here's one problem. Uranus's moons are covered in ice. A collision so powerful that it made the planet tilt would have resulted in disrupting the moon's movement and their position. But they seem relatively untouched, and all the ice covering them is still intact. But any major changes happening with Uranus would have generated enough energy to melt the ice. Another reason for Uranus's strange position might be its rings. Yup, Uranus has rings just like Saturn, except they're lighter and fainter. Saturn's rings are mostly billions of chunks of ice and rock floating in orbit. Some particles can be the size of a pebble, while others can reach the size of a house. Wow! Other particles are broken up comets, asteroids, and moons torn apart by Saturn's gravity. If you observe the rings from afar, they look like colorful stripes made up of thousands of different streaks, but there are actually only eight layers of rings. Uranus might have had rings that were just as glorious as Saturn's around 4.5 billion years ago. The balance between Saturn's gravity and its rings might be responsible for keeping the planet upright so that it doesn't tilt over. If Uranus had the same rings, they could prevent the planet from toppling over. The way to solve Uranus's tilting problem might be for the planet to get its rings back. They would help Uranus keep its balance. On the other hand, hey, we like it just the way it is. You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward, and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost 5 miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about 7 months and a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies. And the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. 
people just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. Maybe even more than the entire universe has. But scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn. But this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So, the thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now, let's make this model much, much larger and put the M-Drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the Alcubierre bubble. A Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket. Instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away, the ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then, people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there. So there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, these probes could reach the sun in just 40 minutes. But instead, they will head for the star Proxima Centauri. After about 30 years of travel, four more years will pass before we get a signal from the probes. There are several exoplanets in this system, and some scientists hope to find at least traces of life there. But this sail technology can be used in space even without a powerful laser. We can use the sun. If we create a sail the size of a soccer field and unfold it in space, it'll start catching the sun's rays. And since the surface of the sail is reflective, the rays will bounce off the sail. This will create thrust and propel the spacecraft. 
One disadvantage of this technology is that we can only use it inside the solar system. In cold interstellar space, the sail won't be able to catch the sun's rays or solar wind. Another candidate for faster than light travel is an ion thruster. Like a conventional rocket, a spacecraft with ion thrusters would be propelled by gas ejected outward. Only, in this case, the gas would be ejected not because of fuel combustion, but because of an electric field. We'd need to create a powerful electric field inside the engine. Particles of gas passing through this electric field would get accelerated and ejected outside. This would create thrust. And although the acceleration in such an engine would be many times weaker than in a conventional rocket, the ion engine would be able to reach higher speeds. NASA was planning to build an ion-powered spacecraft to fly to Jupiter. Ion engines consume a lot of energy, so the ship was to be equipped with a nuclear reactor and lots of solar panels. Eight large engines were supposed to accelerate the spacecraft to about 56 miles per second. At this speed, the trip from New York to London would take one minute. So far, this technology has been actively tested on different space probes, but it can't provide a solution to how to travel faster than the speed of light. Perhaps people will still be able to travel between galaxies in conventional rockets, but they'll need to use some sort of shortcuts called wormholes. So, back to our space-time blanket. Point A lies at one end, and point B is at the other. Instead of traveling across the entire blanket for millions of years, you can simply fold it. Then point B will be right above point A, and you can quickly get there through a short tunnel between them. Such tunnels are called wormholes. Some scientists believe that wormholes can be inside black holes. But there are two problems here. The nearest black hole is 1,500 light years away. So a trip there would take eons. The second problem is the hole's gravity. Black holes have the strongest gravitational pull of any object in the universe. Their gravity can crush any spacecraft. That's because the gravitational force increases with every inch you move closer to the black hole center. And the force affecting the nose of the spaceship will be much stronger than the force that affects the tail. The spaceship will stretch out like spaghetti and get torn apart. But there's a theory claiming that a spacecraft or even a person can survive falling into a black hole. But only if the black hole is super massive, like the ones that lie in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions and billions of times heavier than the sun. But even though they're heavier, they're also bigger in size. This means gravity probably doesn't increase so fast there. You or your spacecraft might not turn into spaghetti and might even get to see what's at the heart of the black hole. There are thousands of satellites flying around Earth. Some are needed to provide communication and GPS. Others monitor the weather and climate changes. In 2009, one of these satellites was circling our planet and scanning the waves reflected from the Earth's surface. The satellite was looking for changes in the emission of carbon dioxide coming from the planet, but it found something else. Something that completely changed the principle of studying the Earth's ecosystem. The source of the wave was utterly unknown. Scientists wanted to know the nature of these waves, so they tuned the satellite's instruments to the desired frequency and looked at the Earth. At that moment, they saw an unknown red glow surrounding our entire planet. In some places, the glow was weak, and while in others, it shone brightly. At first, everyone assumed that it was sunlight reflected from the Earth and produced unknown red particles. However, the analysis showed the glow's source was on our planet, and it never came from the sun's atmosphere. The glow may be the result of humanity, city lights, exhaust fumes, or something else. But again, scientists made a mistake. The brightest red light was radiated from places without humans. There were no traces of modern civilization. It turned out those places were swarming with plants. The brightest waves come from the Amazon jungle, croplands of the Midwestern US, northern evergreen forests, and other green areas. To understand the cause of the planetary red shining, scientists began to restudy plants. Every living tree, leaf, or blade of grass absorbs carbon dioxide and produces oxygen necessary for life. Plants manage to do it thanks to their ability to absorb sunlight. This process is called photosynthesis. New research showed that every plant emits a red glow during photosynthesis. It happens because they don't absorb all the incoming sunlight. They give part of it back in the form of a red glow. And this part is only 1% from all the receiving sunlight. This small amount of red light is impossible to see with the naked eye. But if you look at millions of plants from afar, 
the wave can be noticed. But still, with the help of special devices, this new photosynthesis process is called chlorophyll fluorescence. This is a hugely important discovery that allows people to monitor the state of nature. Previously, changing the color of trees helped us understand that something was wrong with the forests. For example, if a tree turns yellow, then it's probably not healthy, and we can observe the plant's state through satellites. But there are many exceptions to this method. In autumn, in many regions, almost all trees turn yellow and shed their leaves. But in any case, this monitoring system is not very effective. If we see an unhealthy tree because of its yellow leaves, then it's already too late to cure it. Any change in the red glow allows determining problems with the vegetation before the leaf color changes. And this helps to do something just in time. With the help of satellites, people can now see the problem areas of the planet. Also, the glow helps understand how much carbon dioxide and oxygen trees emit. We can learn about the plant's problem even before it occurs. The glow also comes from seaweed and cytoplankton. More than 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from oceans. Theoretically, it's possible to scan other planets in search of the red glow to understand which of them has a habitable atmosphere. The red glow doesn't only come from our planet. In the depths of outer space, through a telescope, you can see the Horsehead Nebula, one of the most beautiful places in the universe. It's located in the constellation Orion. People called it so because of the similarity with the thrown back head of a horse. This nebula was first discovered in 1888. This huge area of space is illuminated with a rich red color. This beautiful shining is possible because there are many super powerful blue stars inside the nebula. Their energy is absorbed by one of the most common substances in the universe, hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms receive such a strong charge from super powerful stars that they emit red light when they collide with electrons. Just imagine if a super powerful star was burning near our solar system, or if our planet was located in the Horsehead Nebula. Perhaps we wouldn't notice the red glow, so we would live inside this glow. We can observe beautiful multicolored nebulae only from the side, being thousands of light years away from it. Let's go back to our planet. By the way, there's another amazing glow surrounding Earth. It seems to be pulsating, shimmering with different colors, constantly changing its shape. If you look at our planet through special equipment, you will see that it's located inside this pulsating, uneven bubble. The bubble layer is quite thick. It covers the planet at an altitude of 50 to 400 miles above the surface. Even the International Space Station flies inside this glow. Almost all the satellites surrounding the Earth are in the zone too. It's called the ionosphere. It ensures the operation of communication and navigation systems. It helps radio signals and GPS to get to our mobile phones. The ionosphere is a layer of charged particles that separates the upper layers of the atmosphere from pure space. In simple words, this is a sort of an edge of our planet, the boundary between the place where we can breathe and the complete vacuum. Sunlight takes one or two electrons from the gases around the Earth, so these gases become charged particles. A huge accumulation of these floating particles creates the ionosphere. It's constantly changing its shape and size as the planet is rotating around its axis and sunlight's falling unevenly. During the day, the ionosphere is always larger than during the night. Because of this, it looks pulsating and moving in different directions. This instability shortens the life of orbiting satellites and often puts them out of action. But it also helps to provide communication. Radio signals and GPS pass through it and reflect from charged particles and fly to our phones and navigation devices. Earth is not only glowing but also pulsating. An unknown pulse is coming from the surface or the depths of the planet. The pulsation repeats every 26 seconds and never stops. At some point, it's similar to a human heart. It's working almost in the center of the chest. Earth's pulse comes from the planet's center, the equator. But the exact location of the source is unknown. In the 1960s, the pulse called microseism was discovered by seismologists in the US. More than 50 years have passed, and scientists around the world still don't know the nature of this phenomenon. It seems as if our planet has a heart hidden inside the crust. According to research, this heart may be located in the southern or equatorial part of the Atlantic Ocean in the Gulf of Guinea called the Bight of Bonnie. Every winter, the pulse increases, but then its strength weakens again. Scientists began to explore this place and put forward the theory that the ocean creates the pulse. Waves cross the surface and hit the continental shelf of the planet. This impact deforms the ocean floor, 
A strike to any flat surface works on the same principle. Hit any plate with a hammer and you will feel a vibration through the object. The same beats are created by waves hitting the coastline. There are waves all over the world, not only at the equator. So why does micro seism occur at the equator? Because in this place, the sun heats our planet the most. Solar energies increases storms and winds, accelerates ocean currents. Also, in 1980, geologists found out that micro seism pulsates powerfully during storms when the waves hit the shore stronger. Not all scientists agree with this theory. Some researchers believe the planet is pulsating because of the seismic volcanic activity. And there's one that's located on one of the islands in the Bight of Bonnie. The place of pulse origin is close to this volcano. But further observations have shown that micro seism can be found in all places of the Gulf of Guinea. Scientists still can't prove any of the hypotheses.